COVID-19 dominates question time in Parliament. Calls for the government and Barrett to hear the people's grievances. And Barrett New Guinea Limited not backing down. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Tuesday's news. COVID-19 dominated the opening exchanges as Parliament resumed after a five-month hiatus. Lockdowns nationwide, COVID-19 funding and Independence Day celebrations all queried. A moment's silence to commemorate the passing of former members before the August session began. Member for Nawai Kennedy Wenge, the first to query the status of the nationwide measures to combat COVID-19. His question directed to an absent Health Minister Jelta Wong, the Prime Minister responding on his behalf. Uh, this uh, Parliament was saying, we will not have a hard lockdown again. We are adjusting under the new normal operation, operation manual or leave, leaving uh, uh, requirements and protocols to live with COVID-19, we are adjusting our life. Marape falling back on the issue of border security and the importance of maintaining a largely healthy population. With transparency, PNG thrown caution to the wind regarding the COVID-19 operational audits. Marape also assuring that a report would shortly be presented. Uh, parliamentary statement on the status of COVID-19. How said you mean we're coming up now, including all the expenditures and operation, where we are in as far as COVID-19 and what is the new normal going forward through a parliamentary statement. The health minister will uh, release a statement for our understanding and appreciation and for the nation to be aware to live with it for the balance of this year. The issue of COVID-19 continuing with Kandap MP Alfred Luke Manasse querying the individual district funds. In those accounts, there are funds designated for different purposes but we don't appear to have a guideline as to how we should spend and for what purpose. Uh, if there is a uh, guideline, then could that be provided to all the members of parliament? Finance Minister and Leader of Government Business, Rainbow Paita, outlining that previous cabinet guidelines on funding, stating that a high level of flexibility remained and was at the prerogative of the individual governors for provincial disbursement. A funding that's allocated to them, so I think the member, I think that's a question that most members are also asking. And uh, in relation to that, uh, we will give the guidelines. And it's a document that's been disseminated to the provincial treasuries and the district treasuries as well. So, Paita stating that this was additional funding on top of the DSIP already given. For member for TYCRC, Kobe Bomareo, it was the small matter of independence. Querying celebrations on the upcoming 45th Independence Day, considering the social distancing requirements in place. You saw or will the some form of management the level of celebration will be. And will the government be able to assist with a bit of funding so that we can do scattered celebration in various local government councils or various schools or, or bases in our districts and provinces. At the last parliament sitting in March, Treasurer Ian Ling Stuckey had outlined a massive 5.6 billion Kina stimulus package for the country that had been earmarked in preparation for PNG's COVID-19 response. Member concerns reflecting those of their constituencies, considering the large effects on economic scale in the country. Parliament will resume on Thursday, the 27th of August at 10 a.m. Jeremy Mogi, National TV News. It's been four months now since Barrack New Guinea Limited seized operations at the Pogera mine. Around 2,800 national workers residing around the country were made redundant, amongst them locals from Pogera. Resource towns are known to heavily depend on resource mine and plant sites. However, for the locals, negotiations between Barrack New Guinea Limited and the government is taking a toll on the people who heavily depended on the mine. 
There is currently a high level of security presence in the special mining lease area at Pogora Township. The mine's closure in the last four months seeing huge economic impacts that has affected the lives of locals who depend heavily on the mine. The people of Pogara are requesting the audience of the 111 members of parliament to hear their stories, going to the extent of chartering a flight to bring them to Pogara. Of the 111 who had responded, the opposition leader Beldenama and Central Bougainville MP Sam Akotai. Of the two, only one made it to Pogara Valley after the pandemic controller stopped the charter flight to Vanimo to pick the opposition leader. The people of Pogara pleading for the national government to find a solution to how they can continue their way of life as the mine area for the last 30 years depended heavily on barrack to operate essential services. <laughs> Economic wise, the losses to local SMEs are in the millions. Subcontracts cancelled, and now what used to be garden land unable to produce crops, the consequence of living next to a mine. People are losing 18 million kina. Now, long less man alone. We've not lost him 6 million kina. We've not lost him 24 million kina. Long last four months, we may. Lara, you may have. If you leave high enough, concern affected, impacted people. Sing out the more parliamentary scam, low place, low year. Now only can give him concern. View, low you may. Carry one of parliament, I want to do something, I'll make him. Whether be good or bad, low people. The Central Bougainville member calling for peace with landowners, stating that the people should not even think twice about taking the situation into their own hands, but instead unite to work out the best solution for the people of Pogara, Enga, and the country. We come on time experience, look, kill him, all mama, me look him, only die, all picking only die, all big man, very only die, all innocent people, only die. That's why I'm talking to you, please, at all costs, lead us from the plan of Pogra. You maintain in peace. A petition was handed to Mr. Akotai to present in Parliament. I'm willing to take this petition into Parliament. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. The negotiations with the government and Barrack New Guinea Limited on the status of Pogera Mine four months after its closure has hit an all-time low. Barrack New Guinea Limited calling the negotiations cordial, while Prime Minister James Marapa insists any mining or gas project going forward would be tailored to PNG's needs first. Adelaide Zurich's Curry spoke to Barrick CEO Mark Bristow on how far negotiations have gone in this exclusive interview. In July, Judge Kandakasi ordered Barrack New Guinea Limited and the state to negotiate on the extension of the special mining lease after Barrack went to courts when the state cancelled an application by Barrack to extend the special mining lease. In short, there was a, a, a government change of government, but it wasn't a change of country. And, uh, and that change of government occurred in June 2019 and we never once got warned or suggested we wouldn't renew the mining lease. As I pointed out, we jointly with government approached uh, the courts to recognize our right to continue to operate. And so, uh, you know, when you go through that, nearly nine months later to suddenly wake up one morning and decide that everyone's got to leave is an illogical thing. One would have imagined if there was a view about we had done something wrong and we've never been indicted or uh, sanctioned on any legacy issues. He said negotiations had started in 2017, leading up to the expiry of the 30 years SML in August 2020, were consistent until January when negotiations went cold, according to Mr. Bristow. 
And I've SMSed him, I've WhatsApped him, I've written uh, letters to him and the, and the various uh, uh, representatives and the negotiating team, and um, and said we need to negotiate this. Um, and it it and and so our point is at any time we can stop, we can negotiate. There's no conditions. It has been made publicly that the Marpa government would not settle for anything less than a 50-50 agreement with BNL. The drafting and passing of the Mining Act may have been the delay with the government. In July, Enga Governor Peter Ipata stated that the Marpa government was adamant that the people of Papua New Guinea will benefit from resources being removed from their land. He is, he is saying that the country must have upside, not the, not the downside. You know, we must have a higher equity than the investors. But, you know, they will still make their money if they will come in and operate. Uh, they, they, will be, they will not be operating for us for free. So that's got to be a give and take. So what has been negotiated so far? Barrick stated the 50-50 agreement would be possible if the PNG government put up capital investment for the project. We don't expect the government to put up capital. It should be using tax money and other money for um, developing the country. It's us as, as investors that should be putting up the risk capital and recouping it first before we sp share the, the, the spoils. In a joint letter by both Barrick and Pogara Landowners Association to the Prime Minister James Marpe, it said that last October, Bristow, when meeting Prime Minister James Marpe, offered 200 million US dollar prepayment of corporate tax upon the granting of the SML. And we put together a letter and we increased the economic benefits to 57% in favor of the state and other PNG stakeholders and a reduction of 43% uh, for the shareholders. Because this is a 20-year project and it requires capital. The statement coming after BNL made it clear to the government on the previous 20% equity stake that was given to them in the previous SML deal. The 20% sold by the previous government and had signed a deal that they would not take up any further equity in the future. Uh, people don't really appreciate that Papua New Guinea used to own 25% of Pogra and the government, central government, sold 20% and when they sold it, they, uh, they undertook that they will never retake any equity in this project. Yes, put it in some proposal for greater participation, we would have accepted that and we would have gone on. But when did the company come and even propose this new arrangement. They never did. They never did before. And unless I put my foot down, Prime Minister put his foot down, so they are coming around with a better uh, proposals. But that's not what we want. We want to stick to our original plan. And we are saying the resources now reverted back to the state. The SML has expired. And therefore, we have to offer. They can't offer. They are in no position to offer. But while negotiation has gone cold, the image of a ghost mine remains in Polgera, as the locals, former employees and the country awaits when communication will begin between the state and barrack. Adelaide Zirks Kari National, MTV News. Meanwhile, Prime Minister James Marape has responded to statements made by Barrick New Guinea Limited. He said the government will await the national court's decision before taking appropriate steps to reopen the mine. In a media statement released this afternoon, Marape states the expiry of the special mining lease and the refusal to extend the SML is in line with PNG's laws and in the interest of the nation. Marap is stating, while the issue is before the court, the state had offered BNL equity and possible operatorship and to discuss without prejudice or biases, but BNL has refused this option unless the special mining lease was approved. He believes the country could benefit from a total of 640 million US dollars of net earning if the mine was operated by the state. Marapa said the money will greatly benefit PNG's economy. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more stories after these messages. Stay with us.
Welcome back. 41 chairmen from the integrated land group of segments 2 and 3 of the PNG LNG gas pipeline in Ella province have agreed to work together to bring about development and services. They said this after electing a director to represent them in their trust company, PNG LNG Gas Pipeline Limited, that was created by the Mineral Resources Development Company Limited. The PNG LNG gas pipeline and plant site passes through four provinces and has eight segments altogether. It passes from Southern Highlands, Hela, through to Gulf and Central provinces, making them portion 152. In order for the pipeline landowners and plant site LOs to access the 2% LO benefits from the PNG LNG 2009 Benefits Agreement, they need to vote their directors. While other segments in Gulf, Central and Southern Highlands have their directors appointed, and are also benefiting from the royalty and equity payments, segments 2 and 3 people are still struggling. The portion 152 in the plant, plant side and other two or three segments already receiving this and they're doing worthwhile investments while my people of Hela sadly sitting for court decisions. We must withdraw court decisions, go back and elect clan leaders, open up trust account and flow of benefits must be seen. Leadership in fighting has displaced the Benaria people of Como Magarima electorate. They have been waiting to get the outstanding payments since 2014. The Petroleum and Energy Department and MRDC has completed clan vetting and opened their bank accounts, which has paved way for them to complete the process in nominating their directors. <laughs> The trust company PNG LNG Gas Pipeline Limited has a full board that will allow for benefits to flow in the right path. The pipeline LOs in Hela saw this as a success to come together to support their leaders and stop tribal fighting and killings in Hela to allow for free movement of people as well as for services to reach them. So we manage a different Olay students. We want the Olay students. Boy Brad comes in down, you miss another one of them, and then you may walk boom on them, and then you may go forward. Thank you. Vasenata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. And some good news from Hela. Little is heard of the education attainment of Hela province. One education institution opening up opportunities is the Hela Flexible Open Distance Education, or FOD, in the Tari capital. About 30 of its students graduated recently in a small but very significant event for education in Hela. The 30 students were praised for their efforts to complete this education level. Studying different subjects, Ford is now giving equal chance to excel in education. The Hela Education Director says the institution must be supported. So government under the leadership of Mr. Maraba is now trying to redirect the way we think, putting people into technical but at the same time doing technical skills. Hela is home to the largest single investment in the oil and gas sector with the PNG LNG project, a project the country relies heavily to drive its economy. For the provincial government, it's a new dimension for education to forward in partnership with the University of Goroka. Many completed courses in teaching, business studies, childhood learning, among others. Please, this line is so important. You have a direction. You are focused. You have this determination to move L education to another dimension. Nearly 100,000 kina is being allocated to build a new campus for the small institution. Despite not much attention in the past, many have been urged to apply and be educated. The division of food encourages students and also communities to help build the institution. So we are on the right way. Let's work hard. And my, uh, my leadership for this year. My assurances, I will give you that support. About 80 other students have been selected by UOG to continue other courses through food. 
Jaglapav Junior National MTV News. The PNG Defense Forces maritime element yesterday intercepted what is assumed to be a Chinese vessel between Kaviang and Manus after a routine patrol noticed suspicious movement on board. Sources from the Lombrum Naval Base have said that eight crew members of the unnamed vessel have been detained, one of whom is currently admitted to the Kaviang General Hospital after receiving gunshot wounds. The vessel is assumed to be operating illegally in PNG waters, with the source saying the Navy took aggressive action after non-compliance by the crew who had refused to allow for boarding. At present, all crew members are being interrogated by PNG Customs officials with assistance from the Australian Federal Police. In 2017, the same vessel had been intercepted in Milne Bay waters, with cocaine also being seized off the vessel. More information will be released once investigations conclude. The oil palm industry corporation has elected a new chairman following the national court's decision on the 7th of August to appoint a new board chairman forthwith. Executive chairman of the Hoskins Oil Palm Growers Association, Patrick Rao, has been appointed the new chairman and takes over Stuart Tataro. First on the new chairman's shopping list is to make amendments to the oil palm Act. The Oil Palm Industry Corporation is the mouthpiece of the five Oil Palm Growers Association in the four oil palm growing provinces of West New Britain, Milan Bay, Northern and New Island Province. It has the sole responsibility to provide extension and support to small older oil palm growers. And small older farmers make up 35 to 40 percent of the oil palm industry. Uh, last year we made about 1.14 million US dollars in export, export earnings. You're looking at around about two to three hundred million going straight to the pockets of our small owners. Okay, the challenge that we are facing is our prices are dropping. We normally enjoy oil palm prices uh, earlier, 30, 20 years ago. It was around about two thousand dollars. It dropped all the way to thousand dollars and now it's down to five hundred and seventy US dollars. Newly appointed chairman Patrick Rao, who is also the executive chairman of the Hoskins Oil Palm Growers Association, in thanking the outgoing chairman, says they have a lot of work to do, including reviewing the OPIC Act. Our farmers back in the projects are asking us a lot of questions about the review of the Act. The Act is outdated, and there are Clauses in the egg with needs eggs on attention. There has not been any government funding for extension services since 1997, but the new chairman thanked the acting general secretary, Capsen Pupita, for making a submission for the recurrent budget to fund operational expenses for the year 2021. He also made his intentions known on where future board meetings will be conducted. Our future board meetings will now be taken to all palm growing provinces. We have been meetings in Port Moresby for years. The people who own, or own the oil palm industry, the farmers, wanted to know what we do. So by taking the meetings to the provinces, it will be convenient for them to see all our bodies meeting here. He also revealed plans to make reporting a requirement with project managers of the different projects to submit reports to the headquarters. Meantime, OPIC has started establishing its relationship with the government and looks forward to working with the Deputy Minister responsible for Oil Palm, Henry Amuli, and the Agriculture Department. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. Gender-based violence should be on everyone's agenda. These were the words of NCD Governor Post Pakup during the first ever dialogue on GBV held yesterday. Governor Pakup says GBV is a hindrance to PNG achieving its development goals and needs to be addressed by all stakeholders. In NCD alone, a total of 340,000 women and children have reported experiencing violence every year. 70,000 of these were extreme cases cases and required medical treatment. Governor Pakop outlined the NCDC gold standard strategy to address gender-based violence. The strategy centers around three pillars. Pillar 1, 
to get NCDC staff to walk the talk of zero tolerance of violence in the workplace and their homes. Staff found to be perpetrators of violence will face termination. Pillar 2. Deliver accountably through their programs and partners. All contractors and NCDC programs must adopt a GBV policy and implement it. And Pillar 3. Disrupt and demand. Partnering with government departments, NGOs and the public to carry out awareness, dialogues and setting up a NCD GBV secretariat to help monitor and implement the strategy. Stressing on the importance of addressing GBV, Governor Pakop encouraged other governors to adopt and implement this strategy in their respective provinces. Our presentation and our purpose, one of our goals now, is to share in this uh, forum and future forum, to share our strategy with everyone, especially my goal is to share with my colleague governors, so that they too can start to think about this important agenda and they too can start to adopt a strategy of their own based on their particular environment and, 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 and circumstance in their provinces. ECP Governor Alan Bird shared similar sentiments. We can't just be focused on building the hard infrastructure, as I said earlier. We must also protect our people from violence, and in particular, gender-based violence. And it is incumbent upon those of us who have a voice to speak up for those who cannot and to ensure that there is protection for those who need it. Yana Zoriri, National MTV News. People with kidney diseases or kidney failure are some of the high-risk patients if they have COVID-19. The risk of them infecting fellow patients with similar conditions at a dialysis centre could be devastating. With that in mind, the PNG Kidney Foundation has prepared its own isolation room to allow patients to continue with the dialysis process, but away from other patients. The PNG Kidney Foundation is based in Port Moresby. With the surge of COVID-19 cases in Port Moresby and several hotspots announced, Precautionary measures are being undertaken at the foundation's dialysis center. An isolation room has been set up next to the dialysis center to isolate patients if they have been exposed to COVID-19 hotspots and are showing flu-like symptoms. For this patient, home quarantine, they cannot miss the dialysis treatment three times a week. So PNG Kidney Foundation has set up a separate small dialysis unit where we put up in our porta cabin, porta cabin which is situated outside the dialysis unit, where uh, after being screened by our physician, Dr. Maingu, this patient are advised to continue the dialysis three times a week, but it's separated from our main building, it's separated away from the other patient. With patients already having an underlying condition, chances of their condition accelerating is high. They are in the category of your very high risk patients in terms of COVID-19. If they contract it, they are the ones who would most likely fall in the severe uh, category of patients. The isolation room has already been used by three dialysis patients. The three had recently visited Port Moresby General Hospital, so were advised by the doctor to be home quarantined for three weeks. With the isolation room being set up, they were still able to get dialysis treatment at the center. All patients receiving treatment and their families have been advised to take precautionary measures seriously. We also advise the patient to share this uh, advice with their relative because uh, we didn't want the patient when they're going back at home they are also being exposed with the relative who are being exposed outside. The implications of contracting COVID-19 would mean that they will need to either be transferred out of here to the hospital or to the Rita Flynn facility. That would greatly adverse or uh, have an adverse effect on the, on the dialysis continuity. Due to the limited number of dialysis machines, the PNG Kidney Foundation currently has 14 patients on rotation. Each patient is required to undergo dialysis three times a week. Hygiene measures are also vital for the staff to adhere to as they are attending to high-risk patients. The dialysis center has put in place measures for the staff. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. 
And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.287 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2795 US dollars, 0.3862 Australian dollars, 0.2289 Euro and 28.96 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee and copra closed higher, crude oil is trading, coffee and copra closed lower, sorry, cocoa closed higher. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower, and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 378.313 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 31.83 points higher. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 31.67 points higher. National MTV News continues with more local stories after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. A new classroom and three teachers' houses at St. Margaret's Catholic Primary School in Central Province was opened yesterday. The buildings cost nearly 250,000 kina, with the school erecting one teacher's house under its expense. Karukuhiri MP Peter Isoaimo says under difficult circumstances, the District Development Authority is thinly spreading financing to assist schools build and maintain facilities. Plans to build a new double classroom and teacher's house were initiated by the district and former central governor Kila Alda in the previous term. Through a decision of the district development authority, funding was made available to erect the new facilities. The local MP says the district is massive and the DDA is hit hard with financial constraints, but makes effort by helping all schools in the electorate. At least you may put in one public infrastructure or how many go inside long this plan will get a school. Sapusa Primary School, Brown River Primary School, Dora Primary School, Kuriva Primary School, Kerea Primary School, I think we put in one plus three in one classroom. In this part of Central Province, one primary school will be chosen to be converted to a junior high school. Under the Central Education Division, the school must comply by having necessities like proper electricity supply and foremost improved facilities. The kind of infrastructure that must be put up in your schools, not only Brown River, but in other schools, must be of advanced standard. We need to accommodate for areas. With the new facilities open, all stakeholders have been urged to take ownership. A push for change of mindset and appropriate attitude was echoed by the local MP. Isoaimo says the district will invest where people respect and regard education as high importance. Me also leader blow you, a member blow you. Ready to solve the finding mark mark. Now give him hand or help him come long school. Look all on next level of development. Number one, MME must change in mindset and attitude for you. Jack Lapava Jr. National MTV News. The East New Britain Tourism Authority has embarked on an agro-tourism concept to sustain the tourism industry from crumbling. Provincial Tourism Authority CEO Gard Ranson says the concept includes engaging local farmers to supply fresh produce to urban markets outside of the province. He says the concept has provided an avenue for the province to display not only tourism attractions, but also display other essentials that the province can offer. So far, local farmers have air freighted more than one ton of fresh produce to urban markets in Port Moresby. Renson says the Tourism Authority is using its already available connections with local farmer cooperatives to make the agro-tourism concept a success. The move comes following a financial downturn facing the tourism industry in the province prompted by the impacts of COVID-19. And Chukai Sports is next. Fidli Sukina is here with the details. Thank you, Helen. Women's T20 cricket resumes and lay prepares for independence race. Join me in Chukai Sports after the break.
Sky Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. The women's T20 smash resumed today with Black Bass taking on the Mad Woman. With very little cricket for women happening both domestically and internationally, the Ketan Brothers T20 smash has allowed PNG's national female cricketers enjoy some cricket. The Curtin Brothers T20 Smash is on again. After halting due to the COVID-19 lockdown, today's resumption saw Hastings Black Bears team take on the Trek Pro Mud Women. Today we've got the Women's Smash on, the, the second day of play in that. We've had to shorten that tournament with some delays due to the COVID stuff going on at the moment. Um, so the girls will play today and Thursday and then have finals day on Friday. Um, it's been a good comp, we've seen a good game out here today, there's another game this afternoon. Again, it's a shame that the fans and spectators can't come down. I'm just speaking to our groundsman who was saying his family shattered, they were all going to come down and watch. But sadly, that's the world we live in at the moment. The first inning saw the Black Bears completing the 20 over score in 91 runs with 6 wickets. In chasing the target within 15.2 overs, the Mud Women scored 95 runs with 1 wicket, winning the game. With not much cricket being played, especially for female cricketers, the T20 Smash will be used as a platform for selections for upcoming international games. But it's a good competition, it's an opportunity for our girls. They've got uh, a lot of, they've got an EAP qualifier for a World Cup next year and a global qualifier for a 50 over World Cup. So we'll pick a, a squad out of this that'll train and, and form the basis of the, the Lowers contracted players next year. So it's a big opportunity for them. While current contracted players have a chance to stem their contracts going forward, it's an opportunity for new players for a spot in the national team, the PNG Lewis. Yeah, it'd be a big step up for, for I guess, some of the young, there's some real youngsters out there at the moment. Um, the depth has been tested with, as I said, with the COVID and not being able to bring players in from outside, which is disappointing. It's something that we really like to do to create opportunities for cricketers outside. Um, but this, the, the, it is a test for the younger ones um, and the club girls to step up to play against the low ones. But that's when you're going to see the good ones. They get challenged and, and you know, see how they go at a higher level. Uh, it's a really exciting tournament and a really exciting time to be involved in the women's cricket. Kilawani, Trukai Sports. The hype towards the Independence Russell Cup mountain bike race is evident with over 200 participants registered in the past week, with more expected this week. While a few cyclists can be seen around in Leigh, this event is expected to bring them all together for the race next month. Yesterday, four new mountain bikes were handed over to the Forestry Research Institute team. The hype of this event, however, is not just for the young, although not present. One of these bikes will be given to a 61-year-old woman from Yalu, who also registered. Play MP John Rosso says this is being done to, in the hope to bring everyone together as well as to reignite the days when BMX bikes, bike riding was a favorite pastime for lay kids. The race will take place on the 19th of September with prizes to be won and COVID-19 measures will also be observed. Botanical Gardens, the FRI people who have come on board, so we're going to host the event down there at the Botanical Gardens, showcase also our beautiful Botanical Gardens and try to get it up and running again. We're going to have it around the roundwater area. And uh, in the future, our plans are to improve the roundwater area and the Botanical Gardens, open it, make it accessible to the public and for families. The biggest thing is to get all our families together, make sure that lake goes back to what it used to be, a friendly, safe environment for everyone to enjoy. And, and still ahead in Trukai Sports, Hella Wigman moves up the ladder in the Digital Cup and a preview of Round 8 matches. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. And welcome back to True Kai Sports. The Croton Hella Wigmen are now in second after a 14, 14 points to 6 win over the weekend saw them move up the ladder. Thanks to the Muruks' big loss against the Gurias, the Wigmen claimed second spot. While the Muruks moved to fifth, the Gurias claimed the third position with the NCDC Vipers moving up to fourth of the Digital Cup competition. The 
The weekend's Digicel Cup matches saw a change in the current standings on the ladder. The biggest move from last weekend's matches are the Hella Wigmen. Last year's grand finalists are slowly working their way to another finals berth with coach and former Wigmen Charlie Wabo at the helm. The Wigmen had a promising win over the weekend against the Wagi Tumbe in Port Moresby. The Wigmen scored first in the eighth minute through second rower Kitron Laka. Oh, nice little ball away to Kitron Laka, and that it is the first try going in the way of the Wigmen. Shortly after the try, a penalty was given to the Croton Heller Wigmen. Judah Rinbu adding the extra two points with a conversion. How he goes. And it is. The Wigmen went over in the 34th minute. A flick pass by Tommy Moide, finding center Gilmore Paul for the team's second try. Gilmore Paul goes over for another try. That's the unconverted try leaving the scores at 10 nil at halftime. The Wigmen continued their form into the second half. Eight minutes in, Junior Jeff Mel scoring the Wigmen's third try. Offload to Mel and I think he's over. The Wagi Tumbe managed to score but it was 13 minutes before full time. A break by winger Daniel Tolley linking up with Daniel Francis for the team's only try. The boys from Jivaka are in. The match ending 14 points to 6 in favor of the Hella Wigmen. There has been some significant movements in the ladder over the weekend with a shift in the second, third and fourth position. The Port Mosby Vipers are now in the top four with the Rabal Gurias in third. In second is the Hella Wigmen, while the Snacks Tigers are still in first position. The Muruks loss against the Gurias sees them drop from second place to outside of the top four in fifth place. Min Jinjuwaka and Goroka in the Eastern Highlands Province will host matches in Round 8 of the Digicel Cup competition this Saturday. If both venues comply with the Bani's protocols, Kimbe in West New Britain Province will have an opportunity to host as well until official notification from authorities that no spectator situation remains. JPG Wagitumbe will face Wapnang Hagen Eagles at the John Nambane Oval in Minj while Bintango Gorokalahanis will face, on, face the Lace Next Tigers at the National Sports Institute in Goroka. Both games will kick off at 2 p.m. this Saturday. And that story ends Trukai Sports. Helen will join you after the break with the weather details. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region only. Rain drizzles clearing for a cloudy day, then afternoon showers in Port Moresby. Cloudy with possible occasional rain drizzles in Daru. Cloudy with occasional rain drizzles in Kerma, rain showers with possible thunderstorms in Alutau and rain drizzles easing for a cloudy day, then afternoon showers in Popandita. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. And that's the way it is this Tuesday, the 25th of August, 2020. From all of us here at MTV, pleasant viewing. Bye for now.